Good morning. morning. And welcome everybody to our worship service this morning. This is the 18th Sunday after after Pentecost, or 19th Sunday after Pentecost. And um, I I just made the trip back from Nebraska. I'm proud to say that um, grandpa of our 10th grandchild, a a new baby boy on Tuesday, his name is Levi Gaunt, uh, Nathaniel and, and, and and Liz's little baby boy, and then also um, I can say now that our 11th is on the way, that uh, Mike and Don are expecting another baby in May, so um, we're excited about that. The, the, the biggest reason I mentioned that is because the, the theme of our service today focuses on that preparation of children f- to be citizens in this world, and, and the blessing that we have in children, and the important role that we have as a congregation as we um, as we foster and support a Christian school here at Trinity. We've been looking at the different ministries that are a part of our Trinity tree throughout these last few weeks. And, and this is more than just a branch of the tree. This is really the, the, the trunk of our tree. And the root is certainly the gospel, but our, our school has been the foundation of who we are and why we are here uh, for 152 years, beginning back in 1862. The Old Testament reading for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from Isaiah chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson comes to us from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for you, for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfast of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. According to St. Matthew in the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Lord. 
And the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness is in, in the inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We talked about this gospel text during our, our Lenten season. We talked about it then in, in terms of uh, what we call apologetics, giving a defense for the faith. We, we know that there are a lot of people who want to, to establish a distinction between church and state that would protect everybody from the terrible church who wants to have these terrible effects because of their closed-mindedness and their bigotry and all of those kinds of things. And, and so there are people who want a complete separation of church and state. So we talked about those things during the Lenten season. Today we're going to talk about it in a different perspective. From a, instead of an apologetic perspective, it's, it's more of a statement about stewardship today. Then we talked and focused on the idea that of giving to God what is God's in terms of God being the one who is sovereign over all governments, including what is Caesar's, render to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. But today we're going to talk about how we render to God what is God's when he was talking about money, he was talking about the gifts, he wasn't, and, and, and rather than focusing on taxes, and I do want to refer to that for a little while, we'll also be talking about our gifts as God's people given to the ministry that we have here and to all kinds of other, other ministries as well. You know, there's an adage, an old adage, everybody's familiar with it. There's only two things that we have to do in life. That is to, take, uh, to pay taxes and to die. You know, when you, when you think about that, it's, it's really not true technically on, on either case. We as Christians realize that the reason that we are here is because we believe and trust that we will never die just as Jesus said. Yeah, our bodies and our souls will probably separate if Jesus doesn't come again before that time. But our souls will live forever and there will be a reuniting of body and soul that will live for eternity in heaven that we celebrate every Sunday as we remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember his promise to all of us here. We will never die. Our souls will live on. Our bodies and souls will live for eternity when the time comes. But what about the taxes part? I suppose that People have tried to dodge their taxes and, and tried to evade taxes, and, th and there are penalties for that. There is a, a, a power of the law that prevents that. I mean, any one of us here, if we went to the store 
and said, you know, I don't want to pay my taxes. I'm, not, I'm only going to pay part of, of what you were saying I owed. I'll pay for the product, but I'm not going to pay the tax part. Do you think they would let us out of the store? They'd be calling security immediately. If we went to the gas station and filled up our car, and then when we went in to pay for our gas and, and said, I'm only going to pay part of this. I'm not going to pay the tax part because I don't agree with the way they're using my tax dollars we would probably end up having a police officer following us at some point and, and could even lose our license for not paying for our gas. So there's none of those things that are going to work in our lives. This implies that we can't shortchange the government. The rule of law supports the paying of taxes. And it was that way when this text was first spoken by Jesus. But there are people who will try to shortchange God. You see, we look at our taxes, and for some people it may be, you know, 13%. For some people, 20, 30, 40. For some people, maybe 50% of their income goes out in taxes. And we don't have any choice about that. But we do have a choice in what we give in our offerings to support what happens here at our church, what happens at our school, and happens in various ministries throughout the, the nation and this world. And oftentimes, we will shortchange God because there's no rule of law to enforce our giving to God. Today, I want to talk about stewardship as more than just that sacrifice that we all feel. And, and, and certainly, we encourage sacrificial giving. We encourage percentage giving, first fruits percentage giving, to think in the same terms that we would think in terms of taxes, just realizing that we are not being forced by the rule of the sword, but we are, are being compelled by God's word, working in our hearts, that we want to support the proclamation of that word, and we offer our time and our talents and our treasures to accomplish that. See, people can't do that with the government because they would pay a price, as, even as, as frustrated as people get with the government. We, we hear a lot about people complaining about the corruption of our government, about the misuse of the funds that we have, all of those things. i got to tell you that when this text was first spoken by Jesus, our corruption that we complain about and, and the way the funds are being used in our culture are incomparable to what was going on in the Roman government at that time. Ancient Rome was corrupt to the core. Everything was corrupt, just about. Even when there was this so-called peace within Rome that was called the Pax Romana, it was corrupt. Caesar Augustus had reunited the, emperor, the empire after a series of, of civil wars that had occurred after Julius Caesar had been assassinated. And, and during that time, it was a pretty good time in terms of peace from outside. And it was a very prosperous time. Tiberius was the next Caesar that would come. And this Tiberius was, was a, a Caesar that brought about a reign of terror. It didn't seem that way at first. It seemed like people had hope. People thought that he was going to institute some reforms, and he started to institute some reforms that the, that the common people were excited about. But it wasn't that, that was pretty short-lived. It wasn't too long before his lust for power and his lust for adultery, frankly, overcame him. He, he, he goes off on a, a kind of a self-imposed exile to the island of Capri just to somehow chase after all kinds of lust and debauchery. And he left a military leader in Rome whose name was Sejanus to kind of run the empire. Sejanus was also a power-hungry man who had Tiberius' only son, his only son, poisoned to death. And then he goes on and carries on a, a, an affair with Tiberius' son's widow. All of this politically motivated. 
Once Tiberius caught wind of all of that and caught wind of, of, of the fact that Sejanus was going to try to usurp his role as emperor, Tiberius had Sejanus executed. In spite of all of that corruption, Rome was prospering. And people were allowing that to happen. They, they, they didn't care. Because it was a kind of a, a mix of Roman justice and, and Greek culture and, uh, and an entertainment for the people that left the people passive for a while. At least most of the people, except for the people in Palestine, the Jewish people. Tiberius started to be overrun with a, a, a self-imposed paranoia. He would, would terrorize people. He would have these trials for treason over the most minor things if he felt like someone was a rival to his authority in any way. There was one man who was, 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 was executed simply for carrying a coin that had Tiberius's face on it into a public bathroom saying that he was seditious. This is a reign of terror that took place at the time when Herod Antipas was the tetrarch of, of the Judean area and, and Pontius Pilate was the governor, the procurator. And the Jewish people hated both of those guys. They hated who they were. They hated what they stood for. They hated paying taxes to such a corrupt and a pagan government. They hated the fact that they were forced to pay with a silver denarius and, and, and the denarius had a picture of Tiberius on the one side, and, and it had this inscription, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. See, they were saying that the, the previous Caesar was God, and every Caesar after that complained that they were somehow uh, uh, divine themselves. On the back side of the coin, it said chief priest. This was a self proclaimed title that Tiberius had given for himself, that he was the chief priest. This was blasphemy to God's people. They hated using even the coins that would say those things because they felt like that was somehow giving tribute to something that they didn't believe or they didn't want to be a part of. They hated that. And they also hated the fact that their own people, their own tax collectors who were from their own tribe were able to and authorized to take more money than what the, was actually owed and then, so that they could receive a certain percentage for themselves. They hated that. This was the kind of culture and political climate that Jesus faced in today's text. <coughs> See, these people, the Jewish people, were clamoring for a Messiah, a Messiah who would come and, and rid them of this Roman rule, get rid of all of, these, all of this sedition and, 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 and sickness. And as they waited for that to happen, and as they saw Jesus come, they thought that he might be that kind of Messiah. The Pharisees saw through it. They knew that that wasn't the case, and they wanted to get rid of Jesus because he wasn't the kind of Messiah that they were wanting that would free them from this Roman rule. And so that's when they come up with this ploy, what they thought was the perfect plot, the perfect trap to, to catch Jesus in. They even brought these Herodians who were also supporters of Herod and, and, and the, the Roman regime. They brought them along when they asked this question and, they, and, and, and in such a disingenuous way say, oh Jesus, you were... You tell the truth and you speak truthfully and all of these things. All of that was to try to push Jesus, to nudge Jesus into saying something that would incriminate him or would undermine his popularity with the people. They were confident that if Jesus would just say, no, you don't have to pay those taxes, and as a, as a kind of a populist to, to be popular with the people, that he would be arrested on the spot by the Herodians. That's why they were brought there. But if he didn't say that, then he would lose face with the people. They were convinced that this was a flawless plan and ploy. And Jesus saw through it all. 
Fact is, is after Jesus' resurrection, it only got worse. Eventually, Rome would be destroyed in 70 AD. And then the focus under Nero kind of turned away from Judaism and turned to a hatred of Christians. To the point that there was a, a, a time when, when the streets in Rome were lit up by Christians who were impaled on poles and lit on fire. It became that bad. And we've all heard about what happened in the Colosseum. It was awful. And as we look at those things and wonder why in the world would God allow those things to happen to his people and recognize that Jesus really did have the power to put an end to all of that, to be the kind of Messiah that they wanted, the one that they were looking for. But he didn't do it. Instead, he submitted himself to the point of being crucified on a cross. And certainly people at that point said, this is not the Messiah we were looking for. This was not what they thought God's plan ought to be. But God had a better plan, a bigger plan, a grander plan. A plan of salvation for all peoples and not just a political peace for a, a, a people who were living in Palestine at this particular time. It was a grander plan. The reason I tell you all of this is because we are living in a culture, and we oftentimes talk about it as Christians, how it is moving further and further away from the Christian church and the Christian faith. We will look at government and recognize that not only are the first three commandments in our relationship with God and our ability to worship or being kind of compressed into just in, in, in this time and this place, that there are people who don't want to hear it, that being a, a political leader and saying that you make decisions based on your faith in God is something that is, 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 is hated by people these days. And it certainly doesn't seem to win votes. We are living at a time when not only the first three commandments, but the next three commandments, when we talk about the role of government, when we talk about life and death, especially in regard to abortion in the fifth commandment, and when we talk about the nature of marriage, the definition of marriage as a, as a lifelong relationship of one man and one woman, how that is under attack in so many different ways, in so many different directions. And so as we talk about those things, as we get frustrated with those things, we find ourselves thinking, how can I support that? How can I support this government? You know, those kinds of things. And we get into the same kind of thinking that those people had back when Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees and the Herodians. And it's at that point that we need to recognize that we are a part of something much bigger. In the same way that Jesus had a bigger and a grander plan, the salvation of souls for eternity, we are a part of that plan. We are a part of that movement. And when Jesus says, give to God what is God's, he's saying that everything that we have is God's, and that all that we have and all that we are and all that we do is a part of this movement. Our gifts in church or at our school are not just to support a, a, a place where people can learn arithmetic or, or reading or writing or science or social studies. Why, our students can learn that anywhere. We have something more to offer. We have something bigger. And it's not just a way of protecting our children from certain kinds of teachings. It's not just to protect them from, from something that, that we do not support, but it's bigger than that. See, that's a kind of a victim's mentality. But we have a church and a school that supports the proclamation of God's word, that gives us the tools that we need to receive that forgiveness, but also to be able to take that forgiveness and that gospel message out to other people. That's the only way that there's going to be a, a, a true and long-standing difference in the lives of people in this culture. It's by a change of heart and a change of faith. And we 
We support our school with all that we have and all that we do in such a special way because we are teaching our children the truth of not only what is good and what is right, but what is necessary for our salvation. Where our forgiveness comes from, where our hope lies. And as we see our children perform or hear them perform or, or send them off to school and, and recognize the kinds of things that we have here, it's not just a, a tr an attempt to separate them from a culture, but to prepare them to be a part of that culture, to invade that culture in a way that's going to make a difference. And so I encourage all of us to be generous in all that we give and all that we do for the, the work that's being done here, the work that's being done there, and the work that is being done throughout the world for the sake of Christ. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, as we've been doing for the past few weeks, um, each t after each service, as we focus on a certain aspect of ministry or a certain ministry that we support, um, today we are going to invite uh, Scott Fisher, as soon as he's, he's the brains on this, uh, and, and I, uh, we've got a, a, a 
PowerPoint or a, a slideshow that simply is telling and showing some of the kinds of things that are happening in our school that, uh, that we are a part of, that we support as a congregation, and then um, also wanted to invite Scott to share a few words with us. Well, it looks a lot better at night when I, <laughs> when I have that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott Fisher. Uh, my wife Maggie and I currently have two kids at Trinity School, fourth and first grade. And uh, I'm not really a public, public speaker, so I'll get apologies for that out of the way first. And I don't, uh, I don't really work off of notes or anything like that. So this is all kind of fly by the seat of my pants and... Uh, So. I think Noah's trying to tell me something. So. <laughs> school. 
I just want to say thank you for that support. It, it does mean a lot, and I think it will go to preparing the next generation to be witnesses for Christ. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Scott, and for all that you do. And so uh, we do want to encourage your continued support. As we uh, leave today, I'll, I'll just mention that we do have a catechism examination immediately after the service. So uh, catechism students will be practicing what it means to give expression to their faith, to speak their faith um, in just a few minutes. Uh, God's peace be with you. Yes, another announcement. Carol's in Nebraska right now, so now I know where my lunch is coming from. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. God's peace be with you.